Welcome to the King's College webinar. It's titled, How Should Christians Reflect on Recent Supreme Court Decisions? My name is Stockwell Day. I have the honor of serving as interim president at the King's College. As you may know, through its commitment to the truths of Christianity and a biblical worldview, the King's College mission is to transform society by preparing students for careers in which they help to shape and eventually lead strategic public and private institutions and by supporting faculty members as they directly engage culture through writing and speaking publicly on critical issues. In keeping with this mission, today, you'll hear from King's faculty and alumni who are well prepared to share their expertise and their perspectives on this timely and important conversation regarding the United States court system. So without further ado, I'm gonna leave you in the capable hands of Dr. David Tubbs. He's the Associate Professor of Politics, and he will introduce our topic and our distinguished panel to you. Professor Tubbs. Uh, thank you, Interim President Day, uh, and good afternoon to everyone in the audience. Uh, as just noted, my name is David Tubbs, and I teach courses in politics and constitutional law at the King's College, having arrived here in 2005. It's a special pleasure for me to moderate this panel today, given that three of the four panelists are former students of mine in constitutional law at King's. And the fourth panelist is my newest faculty colleague in the program in politics, philosophy, and economics. In just a few minutes, uh, I shall introduce the four panelists to you. But before doing so, I would like to provide a, a, a brief uh, overview of today's event. As noted, as noted, this panel addresses the question, how should American Christians reflect on recent Supreme Court decisions? That is, what should we think about some of the momentous rulings of the Supreme Court's uh, last term, uh, which ended in the early summer of this year? Our panel today will focus on three of those momentous rulings, specifically Carson versus Macon, uh, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Center, and Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. Uh, but those three presentations will be preceded by a pre presentation on the judicial appointment process, the process by which jurists nominated by the president for a seat on the Supreme Court or another federal court are either confirmed or rejected by the United States Senate. Because of the controversy surrounding particular rulings in the judicial appointment process, it behooves us as both Christians and citizens to reflect on the role of the Supreme Court in our system of government. So let me begin with just a few foundational points. Article three, section one of the constitution states that the federal judicial power in the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and any lower federal courts as Congress may see fit to create. The federal judicial power extends to cases in law and equity that arise under the Constitution, the laws of the United States, and treaties made under their authority. But this summary of federal judicial power does not by itself explain why there has been so much controversy surrounding the Supreme Court in our history. The controversy surely derives largely from, and some would say overwhelmingly from, the exercise of judicial review which is the power of a court to declare a law unconstitutional. Judicial review, it must be noted, is a power not explicitly granted to the Supreme Court in the Constitution. But many jurists and scholars have argued that the power is clearly implied in the Constitution. This, for example, was the view of Alexander Hamilton in his famous uh, uh, Federalist Number 78. Throughout its history, certain rulings by the Supreme Court have given rise to controversy and even national discord because of the exercise of judicial review. And some of those rulings, it must be said, have been highly consequential. Consider the court's infamous ruling in 1857 in Dred Scott versus Sanford, which in the judgment of many scholars precluded any possibility of avoiding a civil war and may, have, may well have hastened our civil war, which began in 1861. In more recent times, say the last 50 to 60 years, some of the most contentious rulings by the Supreme Court involved the court's civil liberties jurisprudence and contested claims about personal rights in the scope of legislative power. 
In today's panel, we will look at three such rulings handed, by, handed down by the Supreme Court in June of this year. Now, let me just uh, summarize them briefly before I introduce the panelists. Uh, in Carson versus Macon, the Supreme Court considered the constitutionality of a tuition assistance program in Maine, which limited such assistance uh, for students attending non-sectarian schools. In Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Center, the court was asked to reconsider its rulings in Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, decided in 1973 and 1992, respectively. Finally, in Kennedy versus Bremerton School District, the court uh, evaluated uh, the suit of a public high school football coach who lost his job after kneeling and praying on the field after his team's games. So this completes my overview of today's panel. Uh, and now I get to um, uh, have, have the pleasure of introducing the four panelists to you. Um, I shall uh, present the panelists in uh, the order in which they will giving, be giving their talks to you. So I begin with uh, attorney Bethany Pickett, um, who will be um, uh, speaking, as I said earlier, about uh, the, the judicial nomination process. Uh, Bethany Pickett graduated from the King's College uh, with a degree in politics, philosophy, and economics in uh, 2012. She is now an attorney at Jackson Walker LLP in Houston, Texas, where she specializes in complex commercial litigation. Before joining Jackson Walker, she was a special, United States, special assistant United States attorney in the Eastern District of Texas, where she represented the United States in uh, criminal uh, prosecutions and civil litigation. Before becoming a prosecutor, uh, Bethany worked uh, in the White House as Deputy Associate Counsel to the President and at the Department of Justice as a counsel in the Civil Rights Division and in the Office of Legal Policy. Uh, she was awarded the Attorney General's Distinguished Service Award for her work on the confirmation of Justice Kavanaugh, um, Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, as noted, Bethany graduated from 2012, uh, graduated from King's in 2012, uh, after which she attended Northwestern University School of Law, graduating from Northwestern in 2016. And then she completed um, uh, a clerkship. She clerked uh, for the Honorable Edith Jones of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Um, Bethany's, uh, uh, in the context of her professional work, um, uh, has uh, um, labored on over 100 federal judicial nominations, including two nominations to the Supreme Court. Uh, the second panelist today will be my colleague, Dr. Joseph Griffith. Um, Dr. Griffith, um, teaches courses in politics, um, political philosophy, and a new constitutional law course at King's called the Constitutional Law of the Federal System in conjunction with our new minor in American constitutionalism. Dr. Griffith earned his PhD in political science from, science from Baylor University um, after majoring in political science and history at Ashland University. Uh, his PhD dissertation is on the subject of American jurisprudence uh, involving the rights of parents to direct their children's education. Um, at King's, uh, in addition to teaching uh, American political thought and constitutional law of the federal system, he also teaches comparative politics and a course on politics and literature. He is a faculty advisor to the King's Debate Society and a fellow of the House of C.S. Lewis. Uh, in academic year 2018-2019, he was a visiting lecturer at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and he was a Richard M. Weaver uh, Fellow at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Our third presenter today will be uh, uh, attorney Josh Craddock. Um, Josh graduated from King's with a PPE degree in 2013. Um, he is now an affiliated scholar at the James Wilson Institute. Um, Josh, after graduating from King's in 2013, attended Harvard Law School, where he served as editor-in-chief of the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. Uh, he later clerked for the Honorable Chief Judge Timothy Timkovich of the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Uh, prior to law school, uh, Mr. Craddock worked as an advocate at the United Nations, where he engaged in negotiations in the sustainable, uh, uh, on the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, his writings have appeared in numerous publications, including the Notre Dame Law Review, the Harvard Journal on Legislation, uh, Newsweek, uh, the Washington Post, and National Review. And our uh, fourth presenter today will be Christopher Ross, Attorney Christopher Ross. Um, 
another PPE graduate uh, graduating uh, from King's in the year 2010. Um, Chris Ross is now an associate in the Washington DC office of Sidley Austin LLP, where he advises clients on high stakes government uh, uh, facing litigation. His work spans uh, the criminal and civil justice systems ranging from assisting clients in the federal, uh, in federal investigations to representing clients in trial and appellate proceedings, including uh, before the United States Supreme Court. Uh, Chris is also committed to pro bono practice with a focus on litigating religious liberty cases. Uh, before joining Sidley Austin, uh, he served as a deputy solicitor general for the state of Ohio and clerked for the Honorable uh, uh, Alice uh, Batchelder of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Uh, so having completed my introduction of the panelists, I would like, now like to turn things over to our first panelist, uh, Bethany Pickett. So Bethany, take it away, please. Thank you, Professor Tubbs, uh, for that kind introduction. As Professor Tubbs mentioned, he taught me constitutional law way back in the day, uh, and I learned more about constitutional law from him and about the law in general from him than I did from my entire legal education in law school. So if you're thinking about going to law school, you should most certainly take Professor Tubbs's class. Um, so it's no surprise to say that Republican presidents and Democrat presidents view the court's role as entirely different. President Trump promised to appoint originalists in the mold of Justice Scalia, and President Biden promised to nominate a Black woman. Originalism, or original public meaning, is the method of, interpre of interpreting the Constitution that asks what the original public meaning of the words in the Constitution were at the time of its ratification. Originalism is the be best method of interpretation because it recognizes the importance of the Constitution as a foundational governing document to our republic its words are not to, to be treated lightly. So it's not about what a judge or a lawyer might subjectively believe the words to mean, but rather what did the public say, what did the public at the time the constitution was written understand these words to mean? By his commitment to appointing originalists, President Trump reshaped the federal judiciary. In the four years he was president, President Trump appointed 229 Article III judges. To put this in perspective, this means in just the four years that he was president, Trump appointed close to 30% of the current active judges serving. For context, that President Obama, during his eight years, only appointed 38% of the judiciary. Especially significant was President Trump's appointment of three justices, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Justice Barrett. I was fortunate to work on both the uh, Kavanaugh nomination and Justice Barrett's nomination. And I can say that our society would look very different today without the president's commitments to, to appointing judges faithful to the rule of law. In just the last term, the Supreme Court decided cases ranging from COVID mandates to the Second Amendment, to voting rights, to abortion, to religious liberty. I'll let my capable co-panelists go into more detail on some of these decisions. Um, and instead, I'm gonna focus on the appointment process. So how is this done? What are the mechanics of confirming a federal judge? To many on the outside, um, this just looks like a black box. And definitely, I thought this was a black box before um, working in this world. It's a very involved process that takes a large amount of time and a large amount of staff across the, across the government, particularly staff at the White House, Department of Justice, and in, the, and in the Senate as well. During the Trump administration, I worked at both the Department of Justice and the Office of Legal Policy, which focuses on confirming federal judges and in the White House Counsel's Office. Um, on this judges project. So the process for Supreme Court nominees and lower court nominees is a little different given the high profile nature of the Supreme Court. For the Supreme Court, uh, President Trump famously had a list of candidates that were vetted beforehand, um, and even before he, he won the nomination. For lower courts, there was not this list. Um, so our team, the president's team working with the Senate uh, had to assemble a list of candidates people who have a history of upholding the rule of law in their practice. And in this process, we analyze their background, their writing, their opinions, if they had been prior judges. Um, and of course, we spent a significant amount of time interviewing all of these candidates. So after this process, the president would then select which candidate to preliminarily move forward with. And that person would then be sent to the Department of Justice, which would then conduct a more thorough background check and do more fulsome research um, into them. And assuming all of that went well at the Department of Justice, the president would then decide whether to formally nominate this person um, and, would, and would publicly announce his selection. 
So then after the announcement process, the Department of Justice has to file something called a Senate Judiciary Questionnaire. Um, we call it SJQs. It's just a really, really long questionnaire on the candidates. Um, and it ranges from asking from everything about their, um, their educational background, what memberships they have, public speeches that they've given, um, any sort of writings that they've had. Um, so both Supreme Court and lower court nominees have to submit uh, these SJQs or these questionnaires to the Senate. So then 28 days after the Senate receives uh, this questionnaire, the Senate then schedules the nominee for a committee hearing. Um, and during this time, the nominee is doing really intense prep for this hearing. They're familiarizing themselves with their prior writings, public speeches, reviewing questions from prior committee hearings, um, anything that they, that could possibly come up in their own hearing, they're, uh, they're prepping for. So then the hearing happens. Uh, and if you haven't watched a committee hearing, you really should not because you're going to learn much about the law, um, but really because you're going to see what these people have to go through um, during this process. So for lower court nominees, um, they're lucky. They get to sit on a panel of, of several different judicial nominees, um, and their hearing only lasts um, a few hours, like half, half of a day. Um, for the Supreme Court, however, there are four days worth of hearings. So the first day is opening statements, um, where the, the nominee, you know, presents opening statements, or, or sorry, the, the senators present opening statements about the nominee. And then the second and third day, the nominee is questioned by the senators. Um, so this is probably what you've seen uh, on TV is, is the second and third day. Um, and then the third day at the end of the day is the confidential closed hearing questioning. And so that's when, um, the nominee appears before the senators behind closed doors and the senators ask the nominee about their background check or about any other things in their record that um, uh, that they need that they need to talk to the nominee about. And then the fourth day is is the witnesses. Um, so after this this long hearing, senators then send something called questions for the record to the nominee, which are uh, uh, which are written questions to them. And these questions uh, tend to be more gotcha type questions. Uh, their main purpose in my experience has been to try to embarrass the nominee or hope the nominee is going to slip up and um, you know, not respond in a right way. And so then they can broadcast that publicly. Um, but once the, the, the questions for the record are returned, the nominee is then scheduled for a committee vote. Um, and so, as I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, this is more of the voting process. If the nominee receives a majority vote in committee, the nominee is voted out and is sent to the entire Senate. Um, and then he goes to the Senate floor. And if he receives the majority vote in the Senate, he's then confirmed. Um, and then after, after he's confirmed by the Senate, then the nomination moves back to the White House and the president then formally commissions him which means that the judge isn't allowed to take his seat on the bench and hear cases. So this is just a, a quick overview of the process. There's a lot of other things that go on as well, um, from blue slips to holding over a nominee, to filibusters, to closure votes. Um, and as you can tell, this is a very involved and time intensive process. And it's not exactly a walk through the park uh, for the nominee or even the staff supporting the nomination. Uh, but the end result is life tenure and the ability to advance the rule of law through judicial service. And so why should Christians care about the court? This is, this is every president's greatest legacy. Generations will either benefit or suffer from the consequences of these judges' decisions. When you vote for the president, you're not just voting for one candidate. You're voting for hundreds of judges that the president will appoint and the decisions that will govern your life and your neighbor's life for generations to come. People often ask me, why should Christians vote? I think the answer is simple because it's a way to love your neighbor and it's a way to cultivate a society where your neighbor and your loved ones can flourish. The judiciary is a check on the excesses of the legislature, executive, and even state governments. Do you want to be able to worship freely? Do you want to operate your business in accordance with your faith and in accordance with your values? Do you want your children to grow up in a free society? Increasingly, these disputes are coming before the courts. And the simple fact is there's a stark difference between how judges appointed by different presidents and different parties handle these issues. As Christians, we need to be on the front lines of making this country a more perfect union. And voting and encouraging our politicians to prioritize judges faithful to the rule of law is how we do this.
Um, so with that, I'll hand this over uh, to Dr. Griffin Griffith. Thank you, Bethany. Uh, I have been asked to discuss the Supreme Court's recent decision in Carson v. Macon. I'll uh, mention the case itself, what, what originated the case, the facts of the case, uh, how the case ruled, and then uh, conclude with a few observations and questions I have uh, for the courts. So the case itself, uh, the state of Maine created a tuition assistance program for parents of school-aged children who live in rural areas. And I didn't know this until reading the uh, opinion of Chief Justice John Roberts, but Maine, he says, is the most rural state in the union. And by this highly technical definition that he uses, it's true. Uh, the number of people in Maine who live in rural areas is greater than in any other state in the country. And so you might think of Alaska maybe as being the most rural state, but Alaska would be the most rural state if you count the total land area. Very few people in Alaska live in those rural areas. Most people live in the urban areas. But in Maine, um, there's a, a high number of people who live in rural areas in Maine. Why is that important? Well, as with all states, Maine requires parents to send their kids to school. Uh, but in over half of the 260 school districts, the state of Maine doesn't provide a secondary school. There is no school in your town or in your area. And so to remedy this problem, the state of Maine launched a tuition assistance program for parents to send their kids to virtually any accredited private school. The total tuition cost of the school doesn't matter. Uh, the school did not need to be accredited by the state of Maine and the school could be located anywhere in the world. The location didn't matter. Uh, I was thinking about how to describe this last night as I was falling asleep. And so, um, I don't know, I'm, I hope you forgive me for this, but I'm, I came up with a pun, wordplay, and it's bad, but I, I have to, I, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I didn't mention this. So here's the main thing about Carson v. Macon. Uh, it wouldn't be making sense for parents to say, get in the car, son, and travel to school, because it's just too rural. There's no school in the area. And so to remedy, this, again, I'm sorry, but to remedy this problem, they, uh, the state um, offers a tuition assistance program. Here's the catch. In 1981, the state of Maine prohibited uh, funds from going to sectarian schools, so religious schools. Two sets of parents uh, sued the states for violating the free exercise clause of the First Amendment, which says that the government may not prohibit uh, the free exercise of religion. The decision itself uh, was a 6-3 majority opinion written by Chief Justice John Roberts, and he says, uh, Maine's tuition assistance program explicitly discriminates against religious institutions, uh, and therefore it violates the free exercise clause. He writes, the program operates to identify and exclude otherwise eligible schools on the basis of their religious exercise. The effect of the law is to disqualify some public school, some private schools from funding solely because they are religious. The law, in other words, effectively targets and penalizes the free exercise of religion. Uh, honestly, this case the decision wasn't all that surprising. It's a, it was a culmination of a line of cases or like an incremental extension of current case law on uh, religious uh, funding to religious organizations. Uh, I'll go into those cases in question and answers if you would like to, but Trinity Lutheran versus Comer and Espinoza, the Department of Revenue, both held something similar. And so uh, Chief Justice Roberts says, we have repeatedly held that the state violates the free exercise clause when it excludes religious observers from otherwise available public benefits. Uh, Justice Stephen Breyer, uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, and Justice Ale Elena Kagan uh, dissent. Breyer and Sotomayor, Sotomayor write uh, individual dissents. And I'd like to highlight two uh, arguments that they present. Uh, the first, they both argue that um, this is a distinction between may and must. Breyer says, we have never previously held that a state must not may, but must use state funds to pay for religious education as part of a tuition program. In other words, uh, the courts, according to Breyer, is forcing the state of Maine to finance religious education. 
The second argument the dissent brings up uh, is that sectarian schools are not a substitute or an acceptable alternative for public schools. Uh, public schools, they argue, must be neutral. Well, Chief Justice Roberts responds to these two arguments in, in the following ways. Uh, first, um, is this a may or is this a must? Well, he says that may, main, may choose or may not choose uh, to defray the costs of private education. It can do that. It could not do that. We're not telling them what to do on that front. But a conditional statement follows. If it does choose to defray the costs of private education, it can't then discriminate on the basis of religion. So he writes, a state need not subsidize private education, but once a state decides to do so, it cannot disqualify some private schools solely because they are religious. I was teaching this case uh, in a summer class at King's um, you know, over the summer, and um, I was asking students, what do you think? Is this a may or is it a must? And a, a very bright student raised his hand and said, um, so it's something like this, right? It's something like, you don't have to bring snacks, but if you do bring snacks, bring enough for everyone. I was like, yeah, that, that's, that's the general idea. If you bring snacks, uh, bring enough for everyone. So second, is the comparison between a sectarian private school or a public and a public school? And Chief Justice Roberts responds to this argument saying that the non-sectarian private schools receiving funds from the state are pretty different, are vastly different than public schools. Unlike public schools, these private schools that are receiving the tuition assistance funds uh, do not have to accept all students, are not free to people who live in the area. Uh, there are various curriculums that the uh, these private schools can use. There's not a curriculum standard. Uh, these private schools do not need to hire state certified teachers. They can be single sexed, like an all boy or an all girl, all girl school. They don't even need to be in, a, in the state of Maine, right? So a couple of parents like used a portion of their money to defray the costs of sending their children to an expensive college prep school in Paris. So this is very different, right? This private schools that are receiving these funds are very different than the public school. And so the comparison isn't appropriate. Really, we should be comparing the private sectarian schools that are not allowed to receive funds under this program and the private non-sectarian schools that are allowed to receive, receive funds. Breyer says that the state must be neutral, but Roberts counters that Maine's program isn't neutral. It expressly discriminates against otherwise eligible private schools simply because they're religious. So let me conclude with a few observations about this case um, and trying to keep in mind the, the title of this panel discussion, How Should Christians, American Christians, Reflect on These Decisions? I think it's important to note that Christians of goodwill can disagree about this, as the Christians on the court demonstrate, right? Both John Roberts and Sonia Sotomayor are Catholic, but they write opposing opinions in this case. Um, but as I see it, uh, one of the fundamental responsibilities of Christians is to teach their children in the way that they should go, according to Proverbs 22, 6. Thomas Aquinas calls parents' authority to direct their children's moral education a principle of natural justice. He writes, it is the parent's duty to look after the salvation of their children, especially before they come to the use of reason. And it's important to note that for Aquinas and for many others, this authority belongs to parents as such, regardless of their religion. So Christian parents have the authority to do this, ought to have the authority to do this. A Jewish parents as well, Muslim parents as well. Aquinas writes, it would be contrary to natural justice if a child were to be taken away from his parents' custody or anything done to him against his parents' wish. Similarly, in the American context, there's a long history of protecting the fundamental rights of parents to reasonably direct their education. One of the landmark decisions on this comes out of a case uh, where Oregon effectively prohibited private schools. There's this ballot initiative motivated by nativist hysteria against Catholics and immigrants after World War I, uh, and it was even spearheaded by the Ku Klux Klan. Well, in 1925, the Supreme Court rules in Pierce v. Society of Sisters that the law is unconstitutional because, it says, 
The child is not the mere creature of the state. So those who nurture him and direct his destiny have the rights, coupled with the high duty, to recognize and prepare him for additional obligations. Now, there are, of course, differences between Pierce v. Society of Sisters and Carson v. Macon. Carson v. Macon, the question is not whether parents have the right to send their kids to private school, a private religious school, but whether the states may withhold public funds from a private school because it's religious. And second, in Carson v. Macon, the court decided the case not on the issue of parental educational rights, but on their free exercise rights. Still, I think the end, is, uh, the end result is similar. Uh, the state may not effectively penalize parents for providing their children with a religious education. This is good news for Christian parents and for religious parents more broadly. Um, briefly, a second observation or question I'd like to put forward. Um, what's next after Carson V. Macon, Macon? What's next at the intersection of religious liberty and school choice? Another way to ask this question is like, what's the easiest way for the government to comply with this ruling, but still accomplish what it wants to accomplish? So to what extent after Carson v. Macon can a state prescribe the admission practices and curriculum of state-funded religious schools? The aphorism is, he who pays the piper calls the tune. Well, it's a little bit unclear, but we know for sure that the rules couldn't be discriminatory. discriminatory. The, the rules applying to sectarian private schools that receive public funds must be neutral and generally applicable. But I want to question whether or not that's uh, sufficient. Why is the First Amendment merely an anti-discrimination provision? Uh, the answer is that in 1990, the Supreme Court ruled in Employment Division of Oregon v. Smith that the First Amendment does not protect individuals from neutral and generally applicable laws. Let's treat religion neutrally. I'm pretty convinced by Justice Alito's concurring opinion in Fulton v. Philadelphia from last term uh, that a First Amendment that doesn't protect the right to uh, drink wine, like sacramental wine, to uh, practice kosher and halal slaughtering practices, uh, to if a law prohibits the circumcision of infants, as many European countries do, if a law wearing any form of head covering in courts, these seem to be uh, neutral insofar as they don't specifically target a religion, they just target a practice. Alito asks basically, what does it matter to the religious person if other people are also prevented from doing what he believes his religion demands? Um, why have we reduced the First Amendment to an anti-discrimination provision where you can burden the free exercise of religion as long as you do the same for everyone else too? So in conclusion, I think uh, in recent years, religious liberty has seen almost nothing but victories at the Supreme Courts. Um, but I think you could also think of this in a streak in baseball terms. Uh, this religious liberty has been hitting a single, a double, a single, a single. A Carson v. Macon, I think, is a single. It's moving around the runners around the bases and maybe even scoring some runs. But the bigger task for the courts, as, as I see it, is to re-examine Department of Employ Employment Division of Oregon versus Smith and uh, I'll enable the First Amendments to really protect the religious liberty uh, of all Americans. And with that, I'd like to pass the mic over to Josh Craddock. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Joe, and I appreciate your, your summary there of Carson B. Macon. And I'm so glad to be speaking here at King's about the recent decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Center. So with the disclaimer that I'm speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of any employer or client, I want to explain the Dobbs decision and how Christians should think about it. To do that, I think we have to take a step back to understand the legal and historical background that led to this decision. So to do that, we have to look at the court's previous decisions in Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. So let's rewind almost 50 years ago to 1973 when the Supreme Court decision Roe v. Wade required states to allow abortion. The seven men forming the majority said that the right to privacy includes a woman's decision to end the life of her preborn child effectively through all nine months of pregnancy. Now Roe created a trimester framework under which states could regulate abortion based on women's health in the second trimester and regulate abortion based on the state's interest in what the Roe called potential life of the fetus in the third trimester subject to an extremely broad health exception. 
So a companion case to Roe called Doe v. Bolton said that women's health considers, quote, all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and the woman's age. So even though states could nominally regulate late-term abortion in the third trimester, days before a child is born, uh, those regulations could actually be easily evaded by any claim that continuing the pregnancy would cause some sort of emotional or psychological burden on the woman. But the Roe decision was widely criticized when it was released, even by legal scholars who you know, personally supported abortion. Because first of all, the 14th Amendment doesn't contain any express right to privacy. The Supreme Court reasoned based on its earlier decisions that the 14th Amendment's guarantee of due process of law has a substantive component that protects individual privacy. And then it extended those earlier decisions applying a right to privacy to this new context of abortion. Second, the court pushed aside pro-life laws that existed in almost every state, as well as centuries of statutory and common law precedent under which abortion had been unlawful at all stages of pregnancy. And instead, the court relied on a pseudo-historical article written by an abortion activist whose scholarship has since been discredited. And even at the time, there was an internal memo that was circulated within Jane Roe's legal team that said that the author had donned, quote, the guise of impartial scholarship while advancing the proper ideological goals. So not exactly neutral history. But aside from those legal objections, Christians also took moral exception to the Roe decision. It was actually a coalition of Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox Christians who organized the first March for Life and who founded pro-life organizations around the country to provide care for women and their babies and advocating for the overturning of Roe. Christians tapped into the doctrine of the Imago Dei, that every human being is created in the image and likeness of God, and that the his, and their Christian historical tradition opposing abortion that actually stretches back to the first century AD in texts like the Didache. So that was Roe and the, the uh, national debate about abortion that it unleashed. Let's fast forward a little bit to 1992, 30 years ago when the court accepted a new case that directly challenged the Roe decision. And many at that time believed that Roe would be overturned because there were new Republican appointed justices who had been appointed to the court. But in a surprise decision, the majority of the court reaffirmed what it called the central holding of Roe. The plurality opinion rejected the Roe trimester framework and the privacy rationale, but it held that there exists a constitutional right to abortion based on the liberty secured by the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. So the 14th Amendment says that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And within that word liberty, the court said that there was a liberty right to abortion. So the court established that states could regulate abortion after fetal viability, as long as the regulation wouldn't impose an undue burden on women seeking abortion and subject to the expansive health exception that we just talked about. But the Casey decision didn't make much sense either, because first, the evidence that abortion was historically considered a liberty had been completely discredited by that time, even among scholars who supported a constitutional right to abortion. And second, fetal viability is a completely arbitrary standard, right? It's a moving target based on medical technology. Now, today, even babies who are 20 to 22 weeks gestational age have survived outside the womb. So a viability line makes factors that are constitutionally irrelevant, such as the state of medicine, constitutionally decisive. Finally, much of the decision focused on the court's own credibility. The justices refused to reverse course on Roe because doing so would admit that the court had made a mistake, which the court was unwilling to do. So that brings us back to the Dobbs case decided this term, which I think is the most important Supreme Court case of our lifetimes. Mississippi passed a law prohibiting most abortions after 15 weeks gestation, and it asked the Supreme Court to reconsider whether laws regulating abortion prior to viability are unconstitutional, and it argued that both Roe and Casey needed to be overturned, making a lot of the criticisms that I just laid out. And after a dramatic and unprecedented leak of the draft opinion, as well as an assassination attempt against Justice Kavanaugh, which was not widely reported, but some of you probably heard about it, the majority on the court stood firm. The decision to uphold the Mississippi law was six to three, and the decision to overturn Roe and Casey was five to four. The majority opinion written by Justice Alito held that the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion, so Roe and Casey are overruled, 
And that has the practical effect of not banning abortion nationwide, but of allowing states to decide their own policy on abortion. Chief Justice Roberts, uh, who would have upheld the Mississippi law but not overturned Roe and Casey, wrote in his concurrence in the judgment that he thought that the viability line from Roe and Casey could be jettisoned without getting rid of the right to an abortion altogether. So I wanna take a look at the, the majority opinion, which examined whether a right to abortion is rooted in the nation's history and tradition, and whether it's an essential component of ordered liberty. The court found that the right to abortion was not deeply rooted in our nation's tradition and history. And it said, quote, until the latter part of the 20th century, there was no support in American law for a constitutional right to obtain an abortion. No state constitutional provision had recognized such a right. Until a few years before Roe, no federal or state court had recognized such a right, nor had any scholarly treatise. Indeed, abortion had long been a crime in every state. So there's three things I want to observe about this majority opinion. The first is that five times the majority calls abortion critically different from any other right that this court has held to fall within the 14th Amendment's protection of liberty, because it destroys what Roe and Casey called fetal life and what the Mississippi law describes as an unborn human being. So central to the Dobbs holding was the unavoidable effect, uh, fact that abortion takes a human life. Second, the court looked to that tradition and history as a guide for interpreting the constitution in kind of the originalist manner that Bethany was talking about a few moments ago. It pointed out that at common law, abortion was regarded as unlawful at all stages, and that by the time of the adoption of the 14th Amendment, three quarters of the states had made abortion a crime at any stage of pregnancy, and the remaining states would soon follow. Now, it's notable that the dissent from the more progressive justices didn't contest that history, which long protected human life from its earliest stages. The third thing I want to call attention to is that the decision analyzed when it should overturn precedent, what lawyers call stare decisis. So the court pointed out how egregious the error in Roe was, its poor reasoning, its unworkability, and the lack of any cognizable re reliance interests on it. The court said that like the famous decision, infamous decision in Plessy v. Ferguson, Roe was egregiously wrong and on a collision course with the Constitution from the day it was decided. I think that's a powerful line because it connects the decision in Roe with the decision that gave its blessing to Jim Crow laws and the separate but equal doctrine that was equally as egregious and wrong. So obviously the work for Christian and pro-life lawyers isn't over. Abortion remains legal in many states, including where you are in New York and in my home state of Colorado. I believe the next step will be to obtain recognition that unborn, child or, unborn children are protected by the 14th Amendment's guarantee that every person is entitled to the equal protection of the laws and that every state has a constitutional duty to protect the life of vulnerable unborn children from abortion in the same way that we protect born human beings from acts of unjustifiable homicide in our neutral and generally applicable homicide laws. But Christians should celebrate the Dobbs decision not only for correcting a grave constitutional error, but also because this decision moves us closer toward justice and the recognition of the unborn child as a bearer of God-given rights to whom we owe duties. And who the psalmist calls and says that God forms and knits together in his mother's womb. So I think this decision brings us one step closer toward that Christian ideal written down in our Declaration of Independence that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights and that among these are life. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my good friend, Chris Ross. Thank you, Josh. And uh, as everyone else has said, it's really a pleasure to be here speaking with you all. Um, I really treasured my time at King's and it really helped set me up for a career in the law. And I'm, I'm very grateful to be a part of this community. <clears throat> so today I'm gonna be speaking about a decision that was called Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. And this was a really interesting case about whether and how individual public employees can exercise religious observance in the workplace which I think is also gonna have broader ramifications for public expressions of faith generally. Now, before I get into the three areas of the First Amendment that the court had to address as part of this case, I wanna provide some of the background facts because there's a lot of contention over this case. And to me, the way the case is framed really makes a huge difference for whether you agree with the six justice majority that Justice Gorsuch wrote or the three justice dissent written by Justice Sotomayor. So the case involved a high school football coach who wanted to publicly publicly express his Christian faith 
Uh, and, and he did this in different ways over time, which included silent prayers by himself on the 50 yard line following a game, leading vocal prayers of players on the field and delivering religious messages in the locker room after a game. So the school where he was coaching told him that he could not perform these religious acts publicly. The school district said that this would violate the First Amendment's establishment clause, and the school could not permit him to do this. Um, they said the students might feel coerced to participate and that it would make it look like the school was endorsing his religious message. Um, the school ultimately terminated his role as a coach um, on the basis of three prayers that he offered by himself after being reprimanded. Um, but as the dissent pointed out, there was also evidence of other religious activity, including prayers in groups. Um, and there was also a lot of media attention that came about after the school reprimanded him. Um, and so th the framing of this, you know, could could depend on where you fall on, on the two sides of the case. Um, turning to the court's analysis, the court eventually disagreed with the school and ruled for the coach. It held that nothing in the Constitution requires a public school to prohibit religious expression. And perhaps a little bit more importantly, it, it further held that under the Constitution, the school could not suppress the coach's religious expression in this way. So to reach this conclusion, the court addressed three different areas of the First Amendment to the Constitution, which include the Free Exercise Clause, the Free Speech Clause, and the Establishment Clause. Um, I promise this next few sentences will be the most legal jargon that I use, but in cases like this, when the court is analyzing whether an individual right is being infringed by government activity, the court uses what's called a burden shifting test. What that means in a case like this is that Coach Kennedy first had to show that his constitutional right, or in this case rights, were being burdened. And if so, then the school district has the burden to justify its policy. Coach Kennedy showed two different burdens. Um, first, he showed that the school infringed on his right to exercise his religion under the Free Exercise Clause. Now, nobody really disputed that he had a sincere religious motivation to offer a prayer of thanks on the playing field after games, which was the basis of the school's punishment. The reason this was a burden on his exercise was because the government was at not acting neutrally toward religious practice. It was explicitly telling him that he could not perform this religious activity. And at the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, it was also allowing other coaches to do other types of secular activities during the same post-game event time. Second, the coach also showed that the school district infringed on his free speech rights. So the First Amendment actually protects teachers and other government employees who do not lose their right to free expression, including religious expression, when they are at school, even though that as government employees, they are also being asked to convey government messages at times. The main point here is that Coach Kennedy was acting as a private citizen and nothing in the way that he prayed implied that it was actually the school or the government doing the speaking. And that was because the prayers were not part of his job as a coach and he was performing them outside of game time. So because the coach showed that his religious exercise and expression were being infringed, the burden shifted over the government to justify that burden. Now, there are various, various tests that could apply to, to figure out whether there was a burden here, um, but the court found that the school failed under all of them. And the reason for that is because the school was arguing that allowing the coach to continue his prayers would infringe yet a third clause of the First Amendment, the prohibition on the establishment of religion. And, and I think what the court <laughs> said next after this is probably the most important part of the case. So in recent decades, the court has used a handful of tests for the Establishment Clause, um, including requiring an examination of what a law's purposes, effects, and entanglement of government with religion were, or whether observers might see that the government was somehow endorsing the religious expression or exercise of the employee or the activity being prohibited. Over several decades, a number of these tests have been really heavily criticized. And as the court said in Kennedy in this case, they really reflected an ahistorical approach to the Establishment Clause. Um, and, and as Bethany suggested, this court, you know, really follows an originalist or original public meaning interpretation of the Constitution. And so going forward, the Establishment Clause is not governed by an analysis of the law's effects or it's uh, the way a, a, an observer of the policy feels under it. It's really driven by whether a policy is justified by history and tradition. And in this case, it held that 
there was no history and tradition in requiring schools to prohibit this type of activity. And so I think this case is actually pretty momentous in this regard, and it's, it's certainly going to upend a lot of litigation over what has up till now been considered an establishment of religion, starting with prayers in schools. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there was a fair amount of disagreement on the facts. Um, I would encourage you to read Justice Sotomayor's dissent for a very different view of how this case could look. She looked at the broader context. Um, she characterized the activity as one where a school official, the coach, was leading prayers that might make students feel coerced or compelled to pray, um, even though they may not be Christians or part of the same denomination as the coach. Um, in, in some prior cases, the court would have held that this did violate the Establishment Clause. Um, so the court actually responded to this particular criticism uh, about coercion, and it reiterated that we live in a, a diverse pluralistic society and that toleration of diverse expressive activities is an important part of living in such a society. And, and what the court said and what I think is right is that a school or other government actor cannot demonstrate hostility toward religion on that basis alone, that somebody might feel coerced um, to participate. Um, you know, as, as Dr. Griffith said, I can certainly see how people of good faith might, might disagree on this conclusion. Um, you know, I'm mindful that different faith traditions and even different denominations within Christianity express themselves differently. But I think what the court did in this case in Kennedy, I, I think that was the right the right baseline. Um, this is another another case in a long line of recent free exercise cases and religious liberty cases where courts reaffirmed that governments cannot be hostile toward religion and that a vibrant society requires a toleration of different beliefs. And, and, and I think that sets an important precedent because it, it reiterates that the first, the first amendment and religious liberty, um, the first amendment serves as a bulwark for liberty. Um, in line with what Bethany was saying, I think it's important that the judiciary in particular and governments in general ought to be checked in their ability to tamp down on religious exercise. And so for these reasons, I, I do think that this decision was a good one. Um, I, you know, I, I do think that the court's conclusion that teachers who are role models um, do not act coercively when they publicly display their religion, um, I think that's an interesting and a powerful observation. Um, it shows that religious people do not have to tamp down on their beliefs, and I think it encourages us as Christians to be courageous in displaying our faith as we engage in society. Um, I, I do think there is a note of warning in uh, Justice Sotomayor's dissent and in other dissents in recent religious liberty cases about this coercion point, which is also being being picked up in you know a fair number of public press and a lot a lot of criticism is being being uh, aimed at this idea. Um, I, I do think it counsels Christians and, and practitioners of other faiths to be prudent in the ways that they're claiming um, the ability to get you know, exceptions from laws or the ability to act according to their faith. We ought to be sure that what we're doing is, you know, careful, carefully tailored and, and consistent with our doctrine and our religion. Um, we, we need to be sure that people are not manufacturing political positions on the basis of a, a religious claim. But on the whole, a case like this shows that when you're acting according to a sincere, religiously motivated doctrine, that you do have the ability under the Constitution to proclaim that faith, and courts are largely going to protect that, um, uh, at least as things currently stand. Um, so I think that is it for my presentation, and I will now turn it back to Professor Tubbs for a Q&A session. Uh, thanks very much, Chris, and uh, thanks to all the panelists. We have 20, 25 minutes uh, left for uh, Q&A. A few questions have already come in, and I wanted to mention to the audience that, unfortunately, uh, Chris Ross has to leave fairly soon, so I wanted to pose one question to him before he departs. Um, based on uh, your concluding remarks, this is not a question that came in um, from the audience. It's something that I'd like to ask you. Um, based on your understanding of an earlier case, um, a case that the court did not decide on its merits, but it still provoked a lot of discussion, namely the Pledge of Allegiance case uh, involving um, Michael Newdow. okay? If you recall, 
um, there were a few justices that wanted the case decided on the merits. Um, this was 2004. Um, I often tell students in the constitutional law course that probably one reason the court did not want to decide the case on the merits, uh, the liberal majority uh, in denying that, in ruling that Mr. Newdow did not have standing. Um, uh, it was a presidential election year. Uh, George W. Bush was running for re-election. If the court had declared the daily recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance unconstitutional, it probably would have been a gift to President Bush in his re-election campaign. But one thing that I find quite interesting, if you simply look at the facts, Newdow's complaint then was that the daily recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance with the phrase under God was subjecting his daughter to a kind of religious propaganda. And he said, this should not be taking place under the auspices of a public school. There should not be any mention of this. And one of the justices said, well, it's true since um, the West Virginia Barnett case, since West Virginia versus Board of Education versus Bar Barnett, no child can be required or compelled to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, most of the audience probably will know that the phrase under God was not added to the Pledge of Allegiance until the 1950s. So it was a different controversy in the 1940s. Nonetheless, the principle remains. No child can be compelled to say the Pledge of Allegiance. But there's nothing it would seem, according to some justices, that would allow one to accept Mr. Newdow's conclusion, that the daily recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance with the phrase under God is some kind of religious exercise or quasi-religious exercise and simply cannot take place uh, uh, in a public school um, because of an extremely um, high wall of separation that's postulated. Did you see something similar, the facts of the Newdow case and what's going on um, in the uh, uh, Kennedy versus Bremerton School District case? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure that I have thought about how I would connect those two cases. Um, I mean, the the immediate difference that it seems to me is there's there's a, a a slight difference between claiming that my religious liberty is being infringed because I'm being compelled to do something, and Coach Kennedy's claim, which was my religious liberty is being infringed because I'm not being permitted to do something. Um, you know, I I, I think that you know first of all as, as a as a lawyer who argues standing on a day-to-day -day basis I, I suspect that there would continue to be a standing problem with uh with mr newdow's case um but yeah i i, I don't think that the coerce the idea of being coerced to perform an act um you know i i think that does have some some purchase i think you know if we were if we were changing the religious adherence at issue if we were if it was a christian who was being forced to you know eat eat a you know a different a different religious diet or who was being forced to say a prayer of a different of a different religion um i i think we would this court would offer some some protection for that and i think the first amendment probably would offer some protection for that um so yeah i i don't know if sort of this this recent, as, as Dr. Griffin said it, I don't know if this recent stri strike, um, re recent streak of singles, dou doubles, and triples um, in favor of religious liberty. I, I don't know if that would necessarily result in a win for, uh, for a case like Newdow, um, but I think we're, what we're seeing is a court that is more intent on um, confirming that society tolerates religious practice. And there's a, there's a whole unbroken line of cases that say we ought not question the sincerity of a person's religious belief. And I don't see that going anywhere anytime soon, as much as, you know, some, some commentators like Linda Greenhouse and Justice Sotomayor's dissent and Kennedy might, might be wanting us to do. But, you know, I, I think the court, especially in a, you know, sort of a 6-3 majority in this situation, is going to continue to be solicitous toward religion. And I personally think it's it's important that that extend to all faiths, and you know we sh we should at least hear out the claims, um, even though they may have resulted in such a large uh, electoral win for the other side in a case like and, this. And just one quick follow up: do you do you think the theory of indirect coercion, which was central to the court's ruling in Lee versus Wiseman, right, um, 
the theory of indirect coercion that when you have this religious fi figure, in that case, a rabbi giving the invocation and benediction at a public high school graduation ceremony, right? The, the question there is, okay, so the rabbi gives a, a religious message uh, chosen by the community to give the invocation and benediction. And the majority says, this is indirectly coercive. The students who are graduating, they feel compelled to stand up. Um, and then you have a debate Justice Scalia writes a memorable dissent, arguing that no, probably they're just standing out of respect. It doesn't mean an endorsement of what the rabbi is saying. Um, and it's a really interesting opinion from the standpoint of, of how much currency does this theory of indirect coercion have? On the basis of Kennedy versus Bremerton School District, do you think the theory of indirect coercion has been weakened significantly? I think it probably has. Um, the court largely jettisoned the Lemon versus Kurtzman test, um, and it, it did not address other lines of sort of precedent that would get into questions of school prayer. And so I think after Kennedy, there are at least open questions as to whether cases like Lee versus Weissman, um, other, other cases involving school prayer, like whether um, you can you know, offer a prayer at the beginning of a football game at a public school, I think these cases are at least open for re-debate. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I'm not saying that the court necessarily would revisit them or would reverse those positions. Um, I, I think they were they went Justice Gorsuch went to pains, it seemed to me, to show how closely Kennedy was decided on its facts, which is that he was fired for offering three private prayers on the sideline. And I, I don't know what the court would do in a Lee versus Weissman type situation where you have, you know, a larger audience that is, you know, arguably being coerced to sit through a prayer. Um, I think Kennedy reopens it. And I think if we're looking at the originalist test of what our history and traditions require, I think it's very possible that there is an originalist argument that Lee and other cases like that are wrong. And so we, we could see a change there. Um, so this is all an open question after Kennedy versus Bremerton. It'll be very interesting to see where the lower courts go with this in the coming years. Thank you. Um, uh, do you need to go? Um, I do. So thank you all for, okay. for your time. Appreciate thank it. Thank you for your participation. Great to see you. So, OK, remaining panelists, uh, two questions have come in. Um, and uh, why don't I begin with Dr. Griffith? Because I this question is based on your presentation on Carson versus Macon. Uh, one audience member asks, uh, does the ruling in this case mean that if parents, I, I guess we'd say probably parents in Maine, if they want their children to receive a religious education, they simply move, need to move to a, a rural town without a high school? I, I, I mean, is that... <laughs> that um, a fair inference? <laughs> yeah, so well, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, right, so, I mean, everyone, uh, rural Maine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wants to wants to move up there. No, I I don't know the intricacies of the law as well. I don't know if you need to establish uh, residence there for a certain number of years before you qualify. But uh, according the law provides that uh, to it provides tuition assistance up to a certain amount. So it doesn't cover all of private school, but up to a certain amount uh, to parents of school age children when there is no high school within a certain number of mileage from your from your home. Um, so maybe, I think is my answer. <laughs> okay. Um, so here is a question I would like to address to Bethany. Um, during Justice Barrett's confirmation, uh, there were concerns over her ability to remain impartial and rule-based according to the Constitution. Um, for any justice, especially given different uh, opinions, different uh, uh, views on how to interpret the Constitution. Uh, what is the expectation concerning personal opinions of of a uh, of a jurist? Um, and do you think that the current court holds to those expectations? If I could just rephrase this slightly, um, when I teach uh, at the beginning of the constitutional law course the two main methods of interpreting the Constitution, originalism and living constitutionalism, I say often to students that it seems 
a judge who subscribes to the originalist approach to constitutional interpretation could, as Justice Scalia argued in his famous essay on originalism, a justice could say, or a judge or somebody who's being nominated to the Supreme Court, I believe the death penalty is clearly constitutional, but at the same time, that same jurist could say, but as a private citizen, I'm against it. As a private citizen, I'm against it. Um, and I think this question is asking what role should personal opinions play when it comes to vetting nominations to the federal judiciary? Is, is, is it okay, for example, to ask somebody who's been nominated, um, like Judge Barrett, you know, what do you think about the death penalty as a constitutional matter? What do you think about the death penalty as a citizen, as a private citizen? Or, or any, any thoughts on that, Bethany? Sure. So I think. I think the core of being a judge is being able to put your personal opinions apart from your uh, judicial philosophy or what or what the law says. Um, so I think those questions, you know, to Justice Barra asking about her personal opinions um, were really of of uh, were insignificant in that Justice Barra has had a proven history of putting her personal opinions to the side when adjudicating cases. So before we nominated her, before the president nominated her to the Supreme Court, um, she, you know, she was a she was a federal judge on the Seventh Circuit. She had hundreds of opinions that we looked at, um, and and you could see from those opinions that you know, dis, despite her having her own personal beliefs, she you know was able to put that aside and truly just interpret the text before her, the case before before her. Um, and, and as a further note to that, too, if you if you watch these Supreme Court hearings, you'll see that the senators ask a lot of uh, these nominees about their personal opinions. You know, what do you think about guns? What do you think about abortion? Um, and actually, it was Justice Ginsburg. Uh, we call it the Ginsburg rule, who first stated that, you know, that it's not the role of the nominee to give their personal opinions and to opine on these hot topics. Um, and in fact, now we have with the Judicial Code of Ethics which actually prohibits candidates from saying, these are my personal beliefs and this is how I'm going to rule. They're not going to give them a foretaste of what their rulings are going to be because that would, that would be inappropriate as, as a judge. Um, and so I think Justice Barrett did a great job um, you know, answering the Senate's questions, but also saying you know, when, when, they, when they crossed over that line into this inappropriate questioning about her personal opinion saying, you know, I'm not going to go there. This would be a violation of my um, judicial code of ethics. Thank you. Could I just add two comments on that? I think that everything sure. Bethany said was so excellent. And I also wanted to just call to mind, there was a, a line of questioning in, in Justice Barrett's con first confirmation to the Seventh Circuit, I believe it was, uh, where basically there's sort of an anti-Catholic line of questioning, like the dogma lives loudly through you, you know, questioning whether she's going to apply uh, the Constitution. And yet, you know, when you look at judges and justices who are not originalist or textualist in their methodology, it's actually not clear what separation between personal opinion and the law is. Uh, because if you're not governed by the original meaning of the text, then you're only governed by things like, you know, emerging standards of decency and what you think, uh, you know, the right answer should be. So if anything, uh, you know, Justice Barrett and the other originalists on the court are more constrained in the outcomes that they reach than the living constitutionalists on the court. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, so Josh, a question for you. Um, let me get up here. Uh, how does the pro-life mission go beyond banning abortion? Um, the person asks, if we understand a fetus to be an unborn child with rights and duties owed to it, uh, is an aspect of the pro-life mission to secure and guarantee child support and government welfare to pregnant women. For example, allowing pregnant women to take out life insurance on the fetus and collecting that insurance in the event of a miscarriage, providing more food stamps and welfare to low-income pregnant women, uh, requiring the biological father to immediately begin paying child support to the pregnant woman, and so forth. Uh, thoughts on that? Question. Sure. 
Yeah, so it's a great question. I think the first thing to emphasize is that the pro-life movement, at least you know, from a private perspective rather than a, a public, you know, state perspective, has already been doing providing a lot of that support, you know, through the various pregnancy centers that offer help to women and their babies through churches that you know take women into their homes or provide them with vehicles or with jobs. Um, so, you know, from a private perspective, a lot of this has already been happening for the last 50 years, and it's been discouraging to see that since the Dobbs opinion, uh, you know, in June alone, over 30 pregnancy centers were attacked. Uh, in basically violent acts of domestic terrorism, uh, attacking groups that were trying to provide care for pregnant women and their babies. Now, I think that pro-lifers can have good faith disagreements about what the role of the state is, uh, but I do, at least you know, speaking from my own behalf and personal opinion, I do think that there is a role for family policy to play uh, to promote uh, you know, some of the things that you were talking about, like providing child support uh, pr you know, prenatally. Uh, some states have already allowed uh, you know, families and, and women to deduct a preborn child on their taxes as a dependent. Uh, the state of Texas, after enacting SB8, uh, created a hundred million dollar fund uh, for women and their babies. So, you know, a lot of states are already doing this. And so from my personal perspective, I think that those developments are actually very good. Uh, but I do think that, you know, pro-lifers can have good faith discussions about what the role of the state is in, you know, providing welfare, uh, just as they would in other contexts, you know, providing for the poor. Obviously, Christians have a, an obligation to provide for the poor, and yet there are good faith discussions and debates among Christians about what the role of welfare is and whether it, you know, provides a net benefit or net, uh, you know, net disadvantage. So I think that those, cons uh, those conversations will continue, but I'm personally encouraged by the actions that states have taken uh, to provide tangible and, uh, you know, financial support uh, to women and families and their babies. Um, okay, a, a question for all three of you, if you could give a short answer. We, we have, I guess, until 125, it's 116. Um, there's still a few questions I'd like to get to that have already come in, but uh, maybe last opportunity for audience to text questions in, 646-355-8946. Uh, for all three of you, quickly, um, in view of the Dobbs decision, how likely do you think it is that the court will fairly soon be reconsidering the first right to privacy case, namely Griswold versus Connecticut. Uh, how likely? Just, you know, uh, do you think it's going to happen or do you think it's just uh, highly unlikely? Uh, Bethany, why don't we, why don't you start? Sure. I, I think it's highly unlikely. Um, so if you understand the procedure that the court has to go through in order to take a case, it takes, uh, I believe, four votes for the court to even be able to, to grant, to internally grant cert on a case. Um, right now, I can count maybe two votes on that question. So Thomas, who has been vocally uh, saying mm -hmm. we should take up that line of case, and then I could maybe see Justice Alito also um, agreeing with Justice Thomas there. But, you know, and then if you're being generous, maybe Justice Barrett would also vote for that. But like, I think really you maybe have one, one solid vote on it. And then really the three are very questionable. So I think it's um, highly unlikely that the court would even take up a case like that. Okay, Dr. Griffith. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, uh, I agree. Brief. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, that's I, right. I also agree, and I think I'll add just a few more reasons. Uh, in addition to having four votes, which I think you only have one, which is Justice Thomas. Um, I, I, in addition to having the four votes to grant certain the case, you already also have to have other uh, issues. So, for example, you would have to have a case that would lead that would squarely present the issue of overturning Griswold. And so there's no state that's, you know, currently considering banning contraception, for example, like just all contraception, right? Um, and so you'd have to have something like that, some state action to present the case. And then you'd have to have the parties actually ask the Supreme Court to Griswold, uh, to overturn Griswold, uh, because there's something called the party presentment doctrine, where usually the Supreme Court isn't going to overturn a case that hasn't been, that the parties haven't asked to, to be overturned. Uh, and then the final thing is, I think even Justice Alito, in his Dobbs opinion, uh, you know, goes out of his way to try and distinguish those other substantive due process cases like Griswold, Lawrence, Obergefell. And he says that the fundamental difference between that case and the abortion context is that abortion takes a human life, in the words of the in the of, in the words of the Mississippi statute. And so I think even there, where Alito is going, seems to be that that's those cases is at least doctrinally are going to be considered a little bit differently uh, from the Dobbs in the abortion context. 
I, I can't resist. I want to add one more thing, and I agree with Josh and Bethany wholeheartedly. Um, each each review of a line of jurisprudence is subject to its own starry. Like we have to apply the same starry decisis process. So, is contrac is the jurisprudence on contraceptives unworkable? as the court said the abortion jurisprudence, jurisprudence was. And no, it's not. It's it's clear. It's workable. Are there other reliance issues? No, it's clear. We So um, even if we grant certs, even if there are votes, to, it doesn't, you no, it's it's not, I don't think it's going to happen. Okay, there's an interesting question that um, I would like to raise, even though um, my uh, professorial inclination is to uh, before asking the question, uh, say that I think there's um, something within the question that really needs immediate attention. But why don't I, why don't I just put it to the three of you, and then you can comment uh, on it uh, as you receive it? Okay. Um, the person submitting this question asserts that a true originalist interpretation of the Constitution would allow a very narrow understanding of who could participate in public life. A true originalist interpretation would leave out black men and all women. Um, and the question is, uh, on the basis of uh, that assertion, um, should we be truly originalist um, and go that far, uh, not allowing uh, women to participate in the political and legal process? Uh, who would like that question? I'd actually like all three of you to say something in response to it, so so the audience doesn't have to hear my views on it. Sure. Well, just at the outset, this is a common misunderstanding of originalism because it fails to comprehend that uh, the amendments are also treated in their original public meaning, and so the questioner is neglecting, for example, the thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth, and nineteenth amendments. Uh, which specifically grants citizenship to uh, all persons, right, including women and Black Americans, 15th Amendment granting the right to vote to Black men, and then the 19th Amendment granting the right to vote to all women. And so uh, an originalist methodology doesn't say that we ignore the Constitution as amended, but we actually look at all the amendments. And, you know, I think all of us have been talking about original interpretations of amendments, uh, the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment today. And so I, that's just at the outset, uh, kind of a common misunderstanding of originalism. Sure. Uh, Bethany, Dr. Griffith, would you like to add to that in, uh, in any way? I mean, I, I totally agree with Josh. I think that's a really uh, common misunderstanding of originalism. The other thing I would say too, is like our founders were wise enough um, and smart enough to understand that they did not have the full picture. Um, and so they included something like the amendment process to know that they could historic, they could be you know, blinded by their own historical moment. And But in order to account for that, they had the amendment process intentionally put into the constitution to create this more perfect union. Um, so I think, you know, um, in, term, in terms of those particular issues, that's something that we as a society have realized, you know, the great evils of, of that, and we have corrected for that. But it's because of the foundation, our foundational document with the amendment process that allowed for that. I it. Dr. Griffith. Yes, thanks. Um, I'd like to echo what Josh and Bethany said. I, I also think, I would also encourage people to not interpret the constitution uh, in the worst possible way. Um, so uh, I'm getting at this, especially from Frederick Douglass's, uh, is the constitution pro or anti-slavery speech. And I think Scotland in 1852, and he says that the constitution is a liberty document. And he says, you ought to interpret the constitution faithfully based on the text, the text, focus on the text of the, the words on the page, because that's what everyone agreed to. And then, um, try to interpret the text in light of these fundamental principles that are animating the documents and that everyone understood uh, were animating the documents. So um, he, he uses the example from uh, the line from Portia's speech in The Merchant of Venice, uh, you, you take a pound of flesh, but not one drop of blood. So interpret the text uh, in light of liberty. And so if you look at the Fifth Amendment, which uh, uh, is the original 14th Amendment prohibiting states from uh, taking people's life, liberty, or property without due process of law, you, you might argue that slavery actually does that. Slavery is an arbitrary taking of uh, certainly liberty of the enslaved person, and it would you could argue that the Fifth Amendment actually, uh, Frederick Douglass argued, many abolitionists argued, uh, that 
this is, slavery itself is inconsistent with the Constitution. So I I, I appreciate the the question, um, but we ought uh, to um, interpret the Constitution um, by its own lights, and the Constitution sees itself as a as a lib a charter of liberty. Okay. Thanks very much. It is now 124, and to my regret, I cannot pose all the questions that came in, but I wanted to thank the audience for its engagement. Uh, some wonderful, qu wonderful questions were submitted that we just don't have time to get to. I tried to choose the questions I thought would have the broadest appeal uh, to the audience. Um, so uh, let me thank once again our wonderful panelists, um, Bethany Pickett, uh, Josh Craddock, and my colleague, Dr. Joseph Griffith. Uh, this has been a fine day. Um, and I'm sure that the audience uh, found uh, your presentations instructive uh, and also provocative in different ways. So my thanks to the panelists, my thanks to the audience and wishing everybody a good afternoon.